Men work by hand to build new twa chamber latrines in zone CC of Kutupalong extension site in Bangladesh. Photo by Kelly Rogers Dev X Cox Bazaar, Bangladesh, overused toilets line the steep embankments of Kutupalong refugee camp. Sagging bamboo and tarpaulin emergency latrines balance precariously near steep drop-offs others sit dangerously near water sources. Some have been damaged their skinny skeletons exposing the concrete rings of a pit partially buried and unsealed, while others are already taped off completely due to waste overflow. The shallow pit latrines many refugees are using can fill up in as little as one week, several Rohingya who built their shelters in the sprawling, scorching maze of the world's largest refugee camp told Devex. After that, the toilets stand unused, until perhaps another group arrives to build several new latrines, according to a refugee named Kamal, who has lived in Qtubalong for 12 years and who led DevX to a particularly problematic area of overflowing latrines in an area of the camp known as Lambasia. Throughout Cox's Bazaar, a seaside district once known more as a Bangladeshi vacation destination than as the home of the world's most persecuted minority, the scale of the water, hygiene, and sanitation challenges is massive and growing. It balloons along with the population of Rohingya who have fled across the border from a violent Myanmar military clearance operation since August. That figure has already surpassed 600,000, on top of the more than 200,000 Rohingya refugees already living in Bangladesh. Every day, men, women, and children continue to arrive, tired, malnourished, and devastated. They need scythe drinking water and sanitary toilets, but neither of these basic services are guaranteed for a gap of nearly 600,000, according to the latest Wash Sector Situation Report on Cox's Bazaar. The overall target for the Wash Sector now stands at more than 1 million people. More than 26,000 temporary emergency latrines have been built so far, but there are concerns regarding the quality, durability and the geographic distribution of the infrastructure, according to the report. During a large-scale refugee crisis, an initial overuse of a limited number of latrines can be expected in the emergency response phase. But in this case, concerns can be traced to the fact that some groups have relied on a limited number of local contractors without providing sufficient technical oversight, several actors on the ground told DevEx, in a push to meet the needs of a suddenly overwhelming number of refugees, other groups parachuted and built shoddy standalone latrines in areas with relative easy access structures that served as a very physical example of their presence and funds, and then left for any kind of emergency, there will be so many non-traditional actors, private foundations, private donors, those who are providing their assistance by emotion, not by logic, said Abu Naim Shafula Talukter, WASH Program Manager and Sector Coordinator at Action Contra La Fame, or Action Against Hunger. For example, if there is a private bank coming here to install 100 tube wells, they will build and they will leave. That's a common phenomenon. In our scenario, this is happening. Prior to the influx of refugees that began in late August, there were five organizations working on WASH in the camps. Previously in Kutupalong Makeshift Camp and Balakali Makeshift Camp, which have now merged to become one mega camp, Action Contra La Fame and International Organization for Migration split the wash services in order to ensure the maintenance of all the points, according to Hildegard Thibergian, Deputy Country Director for SCF, which leads wash cluster coordination. Water and Sanitation Groups are currently working to decommission or reassign for maintenance or overflowing toilets. Photo by Kelly Rogers DevX Now, there are 44 WASH actors, a jump in numbers that makes coordination as big of a challenge as providing sustainable potable water and sanitation options for 1 million people. The intentions of non-traditional donors or groups that haven't exercised strong construction oversight may have been to help, but latrines uphill from water points in particular put the Rohingya population in danger of serious waterborne illness, particularly cholera. Contaminated water also causes many in the camps to suffer from chronic diarrhea and skin diseases, which was apparent to DevEx when speaking with refugees in line at a clinic in Kutupalong. Many guardians pointed to the scabs and irritation on children's bodies and arms. Meanwhile, broken or overflowing latrines, as many as 36% of constructed latrines were about to get, according to a November 5th wash sector report, take up valuable space that could potentially be used for other services. Many organizations have continued to dig shallow tube wells, which are cheaper and quicker to construct at less than 300 feet, but these will likely need to be converted into deep tube wells in order to provide safer drinking water. Very few groups have been chlorinating the wells after construction to protect against fecal contamination, a practice that should be standard, according to ACF's Fibergian. Among eight groups active on the ground now, BRAC's name has come up as one of the guilty parties of too quick construction, having already built more than 11,000 latrines.
but BRAC, an international development organization based in Bangladesh, maintained the SPHERE standard guidelines strictly, according to Ifit Nawaz, the head of BRAC's communications team on the ground, referencing appropriate and adequate toilet facility guidelines, a number of latrines that were installed by actors who may have left the ground after the early onset have become unusable, and have been misaccounted to BRAC, Nawaz said. Nawaz credits the high volume of humanitarian actors on the ground as well as poor coordination in the early stages of the onset for the fact that many latrines and wells were installed between BRAC's established tube well points, leading to eventual contamination problems in BRAC's own water points. Breck employed a team of auditors, who visited each of the organization's wash facilities and conducted thorough inspections to ensure the latrines and tube wells were safe for usage and ensured closing of any possible facility that could pose health threats for the community, she added. This fact-finding mission is ongoing through the cluster, with reports coming almost every week on the state of facilities throughout the sprawling Q2Belong extension site, as well as farther south in Lida and Nayapara makeshift camps. Still, the result on the ground is a large number of latrines and wells that were built without properly surveying the area, which then received little to no maintenance following their construction, an issue that poses ongoing health problems and adds to service gaps now. If we install a hand pump, it requires daily maintenance, ACF's Talukter said. If we install a latrine, it requires daily maintenance. A door can be broken, a roof can be broken. The holding tanks can be filled up in 720 days based on volume. If there is no regular maintenance, it's going to overflow. Ideally, wash committees should be appointed by zone to maintain the wells and latrines installed there, while also involving the local community using the services daily to help keep them clean and functioning. This coordination is already underway, according to Nawaz. And although it is the wash sector coordinator's job to establish guidelines, it is not within their purview to tell other groups what to do. This can lead to the frustration of witnessing groups installing latrines or wells and bailing on up, but being able to do little about it they can't instruct, as the cluster lead. Theoretically they have no authority, no controlling mechanism. They are a support role, Talukter said. As for taking shortcuts on construction by employing unreliable contractors without providing sufficient technical oversight, for example, Talukter believes that NGOs, at the least, end up answering to these practices eventually. If we look at all the NGOs, how they get funds from all the big donors, USAID, SIDA, ECHO, EU, they are doing their own monitoring visits, he said. They are roaming around to see the technical aspects. So the NGOs need to present what they did with the money. The donors can see the quality. Now, as the sector sheds its emergency phase surge programming and moves into efforts to improve services, many latrines will be decommissioned or reassigned to groups currently active on the ground for maintenance, and there will be a focus on constructing block latrines with permanent bases. Already, BRAC has broken ground on new, double-chamber latrines that allow one chamber to fill and be desludged or cleaned, while waste is directed to the other. Several Rohingya refugees in the surrounding area will be tasked with keeping the latrines clean on a daily basis, and a BRAC team will circle back to remove waste from chambers when it's time. BRAC teams are already desludging 50 to 60 latrines a day, Nawaz said. Aside from too few access points to some of the farthest refugee settlement zones, where the task of maintenance will be monumental until more access roads are built, the current unavailability for fecal sludge management options tops the list of challenges for wash actors on the ground to address overflowing latrines. Sector partners are now in talks with the Bangladesh government to identify a solid waste management system and a space for the construction of a large-scale fecal sludge treatment center. There is also a sector-wide call for the construction of deep tube wells, rather than shallow ones. In the meantime, women including 25-year-old Uma Kulsam walk 15 minutes two or three times a day to fetch water to drink, to cook with, and to use to bathe their children. The path is steep in the water, she said, is making them all sick. Her children have been suffering from diarrhea for days. Several groups have come to measure a clearing near the well. Nothing has come of it yet, but I hope they're measuring to build a shower, she said. Right now, she and several other women take turns holding tarps around each other, then wash with the same water that makes them sick to drink. Read more DevX coverage of the Rohingya refugee crisis.